This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Star Wars Armada. Star Wars Armada was published in 2015 by Fantasy Flight Games and designed by James Niffen and Christian T. Peterson. The game takes about two hours to play. The first question people usually have about Star Wars Armada, is this game just a rescaled version of X-Wing Miniatures? And... This is usually followed by the second question, is this game compatible with X-Wing miniatures? The answer to both questions is no. While both games have pre-painted models and rulers and eight-sided dice, they are completely different types of games. The buzzword comparison you'll often hear at the game shop is that Star Wars miniatures is checkers compared to Star Wars Armada's chess. Not bad, especially if you're trying to sell a copy of Armada that's twice as much as X-Wing Miniatures, but not entirely accurate either. In my mind, Star Wars has always been a World War II series with a science fiction paint job. And if you'll follow that analogy with me for just a moment, X-Wing is essentially the Air Force's version of Star Wars with emphasis on frantic dogfighting and cool maneuvers. Armada is the Navy's version of Star Wars. The emphasis is on huge lumbering warships plowing through space planning for that perfect opportunity to unleash their broadsides on one another. So essentially the question is which branch of the armed forces would you rather play as? If you'd rather play something that's highly tactical, seat of your pants, reflex based, then X-Wing Miniatures is probably the game for you. If that's the case, then check out our previous video on X-Wing Miniatures. However, if you prefer a methodical battle of wits with your opponent, where each player's strategy unfolds over several rounds of play, then Armada is your game. With that said, let's begin learning how to play Star Wars Armada. Star Wars Armada is all about captaining big ships. And as a new captain, what better way to learn your new command than with an inspection tour? Star Wars Armada's main game components can be divided into three groups. Ships, squadrons, and upgrades. These components are placed in the following areas. The gameplay area, or the player area. Ships are recognized on the game map with figures and in individual play areas with ship cards. Ships provide players with the necessary firepower to dismantle enemy fleets. Squadrons are recognized on the map with figures and in the gameplay area with squadron cards. Players can deploy squadrons to lash out at enemy warships and defend their own vessel's vulnerabilities against enemy fighters. Upgrades are placed in the player area near their respective ship cards. With upgrades, players can enlist famous leaders and personnel specialists as well as install powerful weapons and defense systems on their ships. In Star Wars Armada, each player's fleet is totally customizable. Players each build their fleets and purchase these components with their fleet points. Before a match begins, each side mutually agree on the number of points they will be allowed to spend on their fleets. This episode will focus on the ship-based aspects of the game. In subsequent episodes, we'll discuss squadrons and fleet building. Star Wars Armada is all about captaining big ships. And, as a new captain, what better way to learn your new command than with an inspection tour? Throughout this tutorial, we will be inspecting this Victory One class Star Destroyer. So, welcome to your new command, Captain. Now, let's learn more about her. In Star Wars Armada, each vessel is represented by a miniature on the game map and a corresponding ship card in the player area. Understanding how each of these ship components interact with each other is critical to learning how to play the game. First, let's begin by learning how to use the ship card. 
Let's begin by looking at the stats in the upper right hand section of the card. Command refers to the number of ship dials that this particular vessel uses in the game. This number also tells you the number of command tokens that you can bank with this ship. The squadron stat refers to the number of squadrons that this ship can command per turn. The engineering stat refers to the proficiency of this ship's engineering department. The next section refers to the vessel's armament and shield ratings. Each ship's hull is divided into four sections. Forward, aft, port, and starboard. The circled numbers refer to each section's shield strength. The box with the colored diamonds refer to the attack dice that can be rolled for each section. In the lower right hand corner of the card is the fleet point cost. Each game has a set number of points that each side used to build their fleet and equip them with upgrades. The bar at the bottom of the card has icons that represent the ship's potential upgrades. The lower left hand side of the card has the upgrade card ship icon. Making our way up from the bottom, the lower left hand side is ship navigation. To navigate your ship, you'll use a combination of the speed dial and the maneuvering tool. Above ship navigation are defense systems. Each ship has a number of defense tokens that can be used to mitigate damage. Finally on the card's upper left is the ship's hull rating and anti-squadron defense capabilities. Hull rating is the number of damage cards that can be inflicted on the vessel before it is destroyed. Anti-squadron defense is the number and type of dice that can be rolled to repel enemy squadrons. Now that we have a basic understanding of the ship cards, let's learn about each of these sections in greater detail. As part of our inspection tour, let's take our Star Destroyer out for a little shakedown cruise. At the beginning of the game, each player uses the speed dial to set their initial speed. After the speed is set, the only way to change your speed, or yaw, is with a navigation dial or navigation token. This means unless you just want to hurdle across the game map, you need to plan in your command dials navigation commands. In this example, I've prepared a Victory Class Star Destroyer to show you how this works. The Range Ruler has tiny little barbs at each section that can be fit into the corner of the Star Destroyer ship's base. The Star Destroyer on the left we've set to Speed 1. Speed 1 will carry you to the first marker on the Range Ruler. Now as you can see on the diagram there are two symbols, one with a vertical line and one with a horizontal line. A vertical line means you can adjust the yaw by one click either to the left or the right. With this symbol turning is optional so you can adjust the yaw or continue straight with the ship. A horizontal line means you can only proceed straight. So this means the Star Destroyer can end its move in either a straight or in a turn position. In this example, the ship ends in a right turn. If you'd like to make a left turn, then you need to move the range ruler to the other side of the ship. If you attempt to make a left turn with the range ruler in this position, you will be in violation. When moving a ship on the range ruler, at no time can the base overlap the ruler. Therefore, move the ruler to the left side of the ship. Now, let's look at a speed 2 maneuver. At speed 2, we can move two lengths on the range ruler. The first length has a horizontal line so we can only move straight. The second length has a vertical line so we can choose to end our maneuver straight or turned. 
Like before, if we wanted to turn in the other direction, we would move the range ruler. Now, let's talk about collisions. Star destroyers are big, and whether it's intentional or not, sometimes you run into things. First, let's look at a ship collision. In this example, the Star Destroyer is going to make a Speed 2 maneuver straight ahead. And, like so many times in life, when there's a collision, there's often a Corvette involved. Whenever the ship bases overlap, there's a collision. When a collision occurs, the currently moving ship is bumped back one speed level on the range ruler, and both ships receive a damage card. Now let's look what happens when there's a collision with a squadron. In our next example, let's say that when the Star Destroyer ends its Speed 2 maneuver, it collides with two battling squadrons. When a collision with squadrons occurred, the opposing player removes both squadrons. The colliding ship completes its movement, and the opposing player gets to reposition both squadrons. When the squadrons are repositioned, both of their bases must be touching the base of the Star Destroyer model. The squadrons aren't actually hit by the Star Destroyer. They just disperse and reform up again. And those are some examples of how collisions work. Let's continue our tour by inspecting the ship's weapons and defenses. In this section of the tour, we're going to look at this Victory 1 class Star Destroyer's armament and shields, as well as the defense systems and hull rating. For armament and shields, it's important to note that many of the statistics on the ship card also appear on the miniature base. When setting up the game, each hull section's shield rating is set on the shield dials. The ship's base also has the lines necessary to trace the firing arc for each hull section. Each hull section also has a targeting point used to establish line of sight with other ships. To learn how all these systems interact with each other, we've set up a little demonstration for the new captain. During a recent patrol, the Empire captured this CR-90 Corvette. We've disabled the engines and locked away the rebel scum on board. This is the perfect opportunity to test out the offensive capabilities of this Victory 1 class Star Destroyer. The forward shields are still up, but no matter, we'll blast through them. Let us begin. First, the Imperial player must establish a line of sight with the target. This is accomplished by tracing a line from the yellow targeting point dot on the hull section you wish to fire from to the dot on the targeted hull section of the Corvette. The Corvette is also well within the firing arc of our front hull weapons. Next we bring in the range ruler to see which weapons we can bring to bear on our target. The Corvette is within close range, so we can bring all of our forward firing weapons to bear. Now before we get started, let's learn how the forward firing guns and the associated dice work. In Star Wars Armada, the attack dice are divided into three groups. Black short range dice, blue medium range dice, and red long range dice. Each of these dice ranges are laid out on the range ruler. As you can see from the range ruler, all three colors of dice are applicable at close range. Blue and red dice are applicable at medium range, and only red are applicable at long range. With all these dice, there are still only three result symbols to keep track of in the game. Rolling a blank has no effect. Rolling a hit removes a layer of shielding or causes one damage to the hull. Rolling a critical removes one layer of shielding or creates a hit with a critical effect. These critical effects are listed on the face-up version of the damage card and create additional damage ramifications. Rolling an accuracy result disables one of the opponent's defense tokens. 
Now let's get back to our weapons test. Now we're ready to test the full capabilities of this Victory Class 1 Star Destroyer. First, roll the attack dice for the forward hull section. If we had a Concentrate Fire Command dial to spend, we'd add one dice to our pool. But we do not, so we roll three red dice and three black dice. Now that the dice are rolled, if we had a Concentrate Fire Command token or another ability with a similar effect, we could re-roll one dice of our choice. We do not, so let's proceed with establishing our damage pool. Reviewing our dice roll results, we want to mark the first critical roll. We have two, but we can only resolve one per turn, so we're going to take that dice and place it near the damage deck. This acts as a reminder that if we eliminate the ship's shields, the first damage card that is drawn is a critical effect. Our next dice is a focus result. Normally, with a focus result, we're allowed to remove one of the opponent's defense tokens this turn. However, since both ships are at a dead stop, no defense tokens on either side can be played. If there's a lesson to be learned here, it's always keep moving in Star Wars Armada. Now, let's resolve the remaining hit results. Our next dice is a double hit, and this eliminates both of the Corvette's shields. We adjust the Corvette's forward shield dial down to zero to indicate this. The remaining three hits impact the ship's hull. Therefore, we start adding damage cards. We see the critical dice next to the damage deck and remember that we need to turn the first damage card face up and resolve it. This critical damage card is for an injured crew, and normally we turn one of our defense tokens down, but we're at a dead stop so it doesn't matter. However, the card still counts as the first hit on the hull. Next, we add three more damage cards to reflect our hits. These cards match the ship's hull rating of 4, and the corvette explodes. Test successful. Okay, let's move on and talk about the defense tokens that we didn't get to use in this example. Star Wars Armada has four defense tokens that can be used to mitigate damage. Redirect, Brace, Evade, and Scatter. Once the damage pool has been established, the defending player can play one of these defense tokens for the desired effect. Once a token is used, you flip it over to its red exhausted side. If you use a token a third time, it's discarded. Tokens are refreshed in the final phase of the game round. Now let's look at the effects for each token type. Redirect allows a player to take damage that would impact one shield and redirect it to an adjacent shield. Brace reduces the dice pool's damage by 50%. The effect of the evade token is determined by the range of the attacker. At long range, it cancels one dice. At medium range, it forces the attacker to re-roll one dice. And at close range, the evade token has no effect. Finally, a scatter token negates the entire attack. Keep the defense tokens in mind as you deal with enemy damage. Next, let's talk a little bit more about the critical effects of damage cards. Star Wars Armada has 52 damage cards in the damage deck. When played for critical damage, they're flipped face up and can be divided into two groups. Critical damage related to the ship and critical damage related to the crew. 
Let's look at the ship critical damage first. There are three types of critical damage related to the ship. The first impacts weapon systems. Weapon system critical damage can impact your ship's attack range and number of attacks, remove your ability to inflict critical damage, and removes attack dice. The second impacts defense systems. Defense system critical damage can create random shield failures, impact shield recovery, remove your ability to spend defense tokens, or even cripple your engineering ability. And the third type impacts ship navigation. Critical damage that affects ship navigation can cause damage when you change speed or execute a maneuver. Now let's look at critical damage as it relates to the crew. Critical damage related to the crew falls into two types. Critical damage that impacts command and navigation. These types of critical damage can reduce your speed, force you to choose new commands on your top command dial, suffer damage when using a command dial, or lose all your command tokens and critical damage that impacts weapons and defense. Critical damage of this type can prevent you from using focus tokens, disables defense tokens, increases collision damage, and forces you to discard a command token. This gives you an idea of how critical damage can impact your ship and crew. And that concludes our tour for weapons and defense systems. Now that we've seen the ship navigate and test-fired her weapons, it's time to learn about command. To understand the command system, let's look at the three ships that come in the core game. The Victory Class Star Destroyer, the Nebulon B Escort Frigate, and the CR-90 Corvette. Command is how a captain coordinates his crew's performance to focus on specific tasks. The concept of command is realized in the game with command dials. Each ship has a different command rating, which gives them a different number of command dials. The larger the ship, the longer it takes for the crew to organize and execute the captain's orders. Therefore, on large warships with a vast complement of teams and specialists, it's necessary to plan out orders over multiple rounds. Ships with smaller, more nimble crew have less command dials to plan out. While these smaller ships have greater command agility, they're also much weaker than their larger counterparts. In the first phase of the game, players plan out their next command on the command dial and place it at the bottom of the stack. Just remember, the more command dials you have, the farther into the future you must plan out. Each round, when you play a command dial, you place it face up next to the ship. The player then has a choice. They can play that command dial immediately for the full effect, or they can bank the command as a token to use later for a lesser effect. Be aware, players can only bank a number of command tokens equal to their command rating and they can only bank one of each type of token. Now, let's take a look at each of the four commands and their various effects on gameplay. Let's look at our Victory 1 class Star Destroyer again. This ship has a command rating of 3, so its player plans out 3 command dials. In round 1, we flip over the top dial to reveal the command. In this example, the player chose Navigate Ship as their command. If the player uses the command dial immediately, then they can increase or decrease their speed by one and adjust their yaw by one click. If instead the player chooses to bank the Navigate token for later, then they can only increase or decrease their speed by one. Now let's say a Concentrate Fire command was played instead. With a Concentrate Fire dial, you can roll one additional dice of an eligible color. 
eligible dice colors are determined by the gun emplacements in the hole section being fired from. If you look at the armament and shield section of the ship card, the colored diamonds correspond to the eligible dice. However, if the player decides to wait and banks a concentrate fire token, then they may only reroll one of their existing dice. Now let's say that instead the command was to repair ships. When a repair ships dial is played immediately, then that player can use 100% of their engineering points. The engineering rating is located in the upper right section of the ship card and translates to the number of points you get per turn. Spending one point will allow you to move one shield point. Spending two points will allow you to recover one shield point. And spending three points will allow you to discard one damage card. Now if the player decides to bank a token instead, then they only get to use 50% of their engineering points. Finally, let's look at the command for ordering squadrons. The order squadrons command dial allows you to order friendly squadrons up to your squadron value. However, if you decide to wait and bank a token, then you can only activate one friendly squadron. The strategic bonus to this command is that you can order squadrons early and not wait till the later squadron phase. Just remember, a squadron can only be activated once per round. If you activate them with this command, then you cannot activate them later during the squadron phase. Now let's talk about which upgrades are available for your new ship. The bottom of the ship card lays out the available upgrades for that particular ship. Each icon can only be filled by one ship upgrade card. For example, the following ship upgrades are available for the Victory 1 class Star Destroyer. First, let's look at the available officer upgrades in the core set. The Weapons Liaison, the Defense Liaison, or Wolf Yalaren. These upgrades allow you to modify command dials and command tokens. Now let's look at the Weapons Team upgrade. The Gunnery Team upgrade allows you to attack from the same hull zone more than once per activation. The drawback is that whole zone cannot target the same ship or squadron. Next, let's look at the offensive retrofit upgrade. The expanded hangar bay upgrade allows you to increase your squadron value by one. Next is the ordnance upgrade. For the assault concussion missiles upgrade, on a roll of a critical on a black dice, each whole zone adjacent to the defending whole zone suffers one damage. Finally, let's look at the available turbo laser upgrades. Turbo laser upgrades allow you to modify or add to your attack dice. And those are the available upgrades for the Victory 1 class Star Destroyer. Be aware that any upgrade you install increases the amount of fleet cost for this ship. There are two classes of upgrades that do not have icons on the ship card. The first are commander upgrades and the second are title upgrades. First, let's talk about commanders. There are two commanders in the core set, one for each side. It's important to note that commanders are powerful upgrades and they can cost a lot of fleet points. However, they have some pretty impressive abilities. Grand Moff Tarkin can grant command tokens to friendly ships. General Duma can review the top four critical damage cards and choose one as the next card to be inflicted on an enemy vessel. You are only allowed one commander per fleet. When a commander is assigned to a ship, that ship becomes the fleet's flagship. Now let's talk about titles. The core game comes with one title per ship type. Titles can only be placed on the specified ship type. Titles are not nearly as expensive as commanders and they can provide some nice bonuses. For example, the Victory Class Star Destroyer can trade two shield points for two more blue attack dice. When a blue critical is rolled against the Corvette, it cancels all attack dice and causes one damage to that ship. And the Nebulon B can gain extra engineering points when a nearby friendly vessel resolves an engineering command. 
Keep these upgrades in mind when you're outfitting your ships. Now, let's take what we've learned about ships and see how it fits into the phases of gameplay. A game round is divided into four phases. First is the command phase, followed by the ship phase, then the squadron phase, and finally the status phase. Now, let's look at the steps for each phase. In the command phase, each player will conduct their actions secretly and simultaneously. First, they select one of four options for their next command. They set those commands on a command dial, and then place that dial on the bottom of their command dial stack. During the ship phase, each player will take alternating turns activating one ship. First, they will reveal the command dial from the top of their command dial stack. They then must choose whether they will spin that dial immediately or bank it as a command token. Next, they will conduct two attacks from separate hulls on their ship. And finally, they will execute their ship maneuver. When all ships on both sides have been activated, proceed to the next phase. In the squadron phase, each player will take alternating turns to activate two of their squadrons. When activating a squadron, a choice is required. That squadron can execute a squadron maneuver, or they can conduct a squadron attack. Attacks can be made against ships or other squadrons if they're within range 1 on the range ruler. When all squadrons on both sides have been activated, proceed to the next phase. Finally, in the status phase, each player will clean up and prepare for the next round. First, refresh all defense tokens. The player who has initiative flips the token over and passes it to the other player. And finally, the round marker will be advanced to the next number. When the round marker reaches 6, the game is over. Fleet points are added up from defeated ships and squadrons. The player with the most fleet points wins the game. Now that we've completed our ship inspection, this concludes the first tutorial for Star Wars Armada by Fantasy Flight Games. In the next episode, we'll cover off on squadrons and building fleets, as well as setting up the entire game. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comments section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.